you might know, the solution space is a unit within the Graduate School of Business. Um, so we are really your, your typical entrepreneurship and innovation center. So we do a lot of work in, in academic um, and research uh, pertaining to entrepreneurship and innovation. So we have programs that we run, a few courses on the MBA, the Streaming Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And then we also run um, an entrepreneurial support program, which we refer to as the E-Track. It's a, an entrepreneurial track that we run with the MTN group. And it's, it's, a, it's a program um, that, that is designed to help and support early stage entrepreneurs to launch and scale. So giving them access to an ecosystem really of, of support. Um, where you know you give access to mentoring, to master classes in in, in specific um, areas of the business, and um, and it's deliberately an ecosystem because we believe that um, you know uh, entrepreneurs move quicker through ideas when they have that support structure. It's much easier, and you move at a much quicker pace when you do it with other people um, supporting um, and you than doing it in your garage at home. Um, and we empower women by making sure that um, there's diversity and inclusion in the way that we select the ventures that we work with. And also they, I'm always there saying, no, we cannot have 60% uh, males uh, as the, you know, the leading co-founders. I'm always questioning that because I believe that we need people internally that are going to be championing for women. We can all look good um, in paper, but the solution space is very deliberate about um, also coming up with solutions because we have been complaining, we're not attracting female entrepreneurs. We need to ask, ask ourselves, why are we not attracting um, them? Um, our programs are, are friendly and designed in a way that attracts females. Uh, is the ecosystem even inviting to females? So um, we do it by creating a pipeline of entrepreneurs because sometimes you have great female entrepreneurs, but maybe they don't feel as comfortable as their male counterparts or you walk into a room of VCs, venture capitalists, and they are all uh, males, predominantly white. They don't look like you. You already know that people invest. I mean, it's a natural thing that happens that you are inclined to invest in your in your tribe, so people that look like you. Um, so it, it's it's us facilitating those those relationship and making sure that there's a great pool of talent and um, a pipeline of female entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, we underestimate um, you know role models, so seeing other females doing it. Um, I think that we need to to find them. They are there um, to find them and. Um, elevate and and um, amplify the work that they are doing so that other females can also come come in and then once you are there as a female um, founder i think it's a paving it forward approach that we we need to 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 take i mean you can't force people but in order to 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 make it better for generations to come um entrepreneurs that are already experienced as as you know women entrepreneurs they need to mentor other entrepreneurs, make, make it seem it's possible. When you see someone else doing it, you know that it's possible. And then when it comes to, um, there's a lot of programs that are designed to support um, early stage entrepreneurs. I think we really, really need to look at how we design those programs. Um, you can't use a blanket approach because, uh, you know, we, we, our physiology is not the same as males. You might have a program, but if I fall pregnant, do you kick me out? If I have children, do I bring them to, to the sessions? Um, looking at, can we make childcare available? How can we incentivize women to, to, know, to, to balance all these um, roles, societal roles, and sometimes gender gender roles that we, we identify as? Um, so you know so so when it comes to practitioners that are supporting entrepreneurs we need to leave what what we say needs to happen we need to be solution driven and we can't be taking a a blanket approach um, um anymore um so we we need to make the space accessible 
I think especially as um, tech entrepreneurs, because mostly there are amazing female tech um, entrepreneurs out there, but um, uh, the, the, we don't trust ourselves enough. Someone was speaking about it earlier on that um, I, you know, I went through a lot of imposter syndrome myself. Um, so I think also just having a community of other women that can remind you when you fall into that trap to say, actually, you can do it and, and, and you do it. So there's a lot of, um, you know, sometimes technical things, but like softer things that we should be doing and no one is going to do it for us. We have to do it for ourselves as women. We have to empower um, our sisters and it's it, it's not it's not even competing against the men and then I also want to say that we need to work with the men I've seen how um, uh, 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 most men now are, are, are you know waking up to the fact that you know the the, the world is not equal and we need we need to tap into their privilege that they they sit on as men and um, I've, I've seen it in my own circles where I would be deliberate about asking a friend or my director to say, look, I want to approach this institution. I know if you approach them with me, they will open the doors and, and you take it from there. And I think that's, that's, that's the approach that, that we need to be taking. Um, but also acknowledging that also as women, we are not a homogeneous group. We, we don't go through the, the same things. So also in the way that we show up in certain spaces, it's not going to be the same. So, um, you know, we, we also just need to be empathetic um, and to understand why other females show up in certain ways and, and others don't. Um, so in terms of my, my transformation journey, um, I, I think it's been a very, a very interesting one, um, if I must say so myself. But if I reflect on what's happened over the last couple of years for me and in terms of my career. Um, I'll start off with um, the opportunities that I have been exposed to and I've been quite fortunate in that I did and I have been able to um, work with some of the best um, and work with some of the uh, best South African exports. Um, in, earlier on in my career I started off with uh, South African breweries but not only that, I also got to be um, exposed to one of the world's most loved brands. Um, that's through Coca-Cola because this was at the soft drinks division. And through that experience, and I guess my experiences as well going forward, um, what shaped them was the fact that I learned about the power of consumers um, and also about the power of great brands. But most importantly, um, I guess I learned a lot about the pride that people take in being able to say, I was part of that, or I was part of the team that either conceptualized that, made that, um, and just being able to point to something and say, I took part in that journey. And uh, very early on, I realized the power in connecting that for people in terms of not only their purpose, but also in terms of um, you know, the experiences that they have um, as part of that. Most importantly as well, I guess, um, seeing the part that you play in that value chain. I, I think that was very, um, that, that was very humbling for me, um, whether it's a commodity at the start of, a start of something, um, if you're looking at a commodities um, or a fast moving consumer goods space, but I think also in the services when I when I look at financial services as well, just being able to connect with um, with what you deliver and being able to say I was part of that or I have been part of that. Um, that was formed very early on in my career and I guess um, one of the things and the key takeouts having worked in all of these organizations has been about the people. Um, you know, these organizations would have not been able to do what they have done without their people and without having invested in their people, um, both from a managerial perspective or even from a leadership perspective. And you, you hear the distinction that I'm making between, you know, your managers as such and, and, and your leaders there. So they invested in terms of time, they invested in terms of building the right skills and capabilities that would be required so that these people could take um, this forward. 
in addition to that, I think they also had great systems and processes in place as well. So great foundations that people could then um, use that um, and, and take that forward. Um, so, you know, that part around, I guess, leaders um, in organizations that really played um, an important role in terms of my formative years, um, in terms of my career. But I'll also, I'd also like to talk about, I guess, the people who I worked with and the people who I encountered as well. Um, you know, if I look at my support structure, let's start there. Um, my family absolutely has played an important role in terms of my transformation. Um, and not only just my family, my friends, um, the people in my, in my personal circle um, or social circle have had an influence in terms of getting me to where I, where I have been. But on the work front as well, um, I've met some great managers. I've met some great leaders. Um, there have been people who've seen the potential in me, um, have opted to mentor me and really walk the journey with me and others who've also sponsored me as well throughout my journey. So um, yeah, I guess the, the, the people really have played an important role in, in terms of my career progression as well, um, over and above the exposure that I've had so far. Okay, so, so for me, gender equality affects all of us. And when half of the population is oh, unable geez. to reach their full potential, um, the whole world is at an enormous disadvantage. And so as we navigate the global crisis, which has crippled global growth, it's really absolutely essential that all hands are on deck to build back better. And so in rebuilding our world, um, if we neglect equal opportunity and empowerment, we'll not have built back better and more resilient and we won't be future fit. And we have a role to play to uplift, to fulfill those people around us who are less um, advantaged and, um, and, and who have so much more to lose. Um, so ladies and gents, my talk today is inspired by the highly talented and influential Nigerian author, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, who many of you might have heard of, and whose hugely successful TED talk, The Danger of a Single Story, I recently listened to. Um, Chimamanda reminds us just how impressionable people are in the face of a story and wonderfully highlights the danger of a single story in particular. And during one powerful recollection, she tells of her time as a 19 year old Nigerian woman studying in the USA and how her white American roommate had a single story of African women, which Chimamanda describes as leading to patronizing but well-meaning pity. What really struck me is uh, Chimamanda's belief that single stories about groups of people rob them of their dignity, but not only that, they also make it difficult to recognize our equal humanity and only serve to highlight our differences, but in a negative way. Now, studies concerning the differences between men and women leaders abound, and um, I'm sure many of you have, have read up on many of those studies. Generally speaking, the vast majority of these positively seek to promote the case for higher numbers of leaders in business, especially in top level roles. And many, if not most of these studies are empirically sound, and they go to great lengths to contextualize their findings, and to this extent, they are indeed insightful and credible. So just for example, and there are many studies, as I say, one study published in the Harvard, um, the Harvard Business Review last year showed that women outscored men on 17 of the 19 capabilities that differentiate excellent leaders from average or poor ones. The top five attributes at which women excel over their male counterparts in this particular study were found to be taking initiative, being resilient, practicing self-development, displaying high integrity and honesty, and developing others, often termed nurturing when associated with women leaders. 
In another study published by the American Pew Research Center in 2018, so not so long ago, respondents rated the extent to which men or women in top executive positions were better at a series of leadership attributes. And women were rated significantly higher than men in the following attributes amongst others, but I wanna highlight the top five. Being compassionate and empathetic, creating a safe and respectful workplace, valuing people from different backgrounds, working out compromises, and here you have it again, being honest and ethical. And perhaps a useful summation of the many commonly held beliefs espousing the differences between men and women leaders is the following courtesy of a Canadian business entrepreneur and influencer by the name of Dan Locke. And I'll quote from one of Dan's published articles. So he says, both men and women have the ability to be very competent leaders. When an opportunity presents itself, either gender can succeed. Men in leadership positions often focus on the following, accomplishing tasks, implementing structure, and establishing power. Women, are the, on the other hand, often focus on caring for the team on a personal level, motivating the team and subordinates, and listening to the team members' ideas, as well as problem solving. Now, I think it's safe to say that um, all of us would resonate strongly with these findings at a general level. However, and in my view, there is a however, the risk of data is that it too can start to shape a single story of what a, of what a successful woman in business looks like, irrespective of how positively it's intended or how positive that general picture is. So to quote Chimamanda again, the single story creates stereotypes. And the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. And so they make one story become the only story. And I believe this also applies to data and to research studies. So whilst the generalizations may be true, and are certainly mostly positive in rightfully and understandably and unapologetically making a strong case for increasing female diversity in business, they are simply never pixelated enough to ever come close to representing the nuanced variety of leadership attributes, personality traits and lived experiences that are 100% unique to each and every woman leader around the world. So I don't know about all of you, and I'm talking to all of the women online today, but although I'm personally very encouraged that women leaders are more honest than men, and I say that a little bit tongue in cheek, amongst the other strengths that have already been mentioned, I imagine that it must be challenging for every individual woman to either recognize or aspire to all of these attributes as, as a kind of blueprint for being a strong and successful woman in business. So I guess having said all of that, where does this leave us? Well, my main contribution today wasn't to regurgitate a whole bunch of studies to you about the differences between men and women. Um, but again, inspired by the danger, danger of a single story, I'd like to use the rest of my time to tell you of my personal experience of working with and for four women leaders. So these are four women leaders that I've had the pleasure of being associated directly with at some stage or another over the past 10 years. These are brief stories um, because by definition, it's impossible to tell somebody else's story and it certainly isn't possible to do that in the space of time that I've got. And they are based on my personal experiences and the positive and lasting impressions that all of these women leaders have left on me. I'm not saying that they are perfect leaders and having worked with many senior, uh, sorry, having worked with many, many senior leaders around the world in my career, it won't surprise you to let you know that I am yet to meet the perfect leader. But what I can vouch for is what I call the consistency 
and the authenticity of how I have experienced these women. So all four of them are poles apart in terms of their personality, their backgrounds, and also their lived experiences. Yet all of them are very successful in their own right. And ladies and gentlemen, I also can't say that the attributes I'll describe today are unique, are unique to them as women. Clearly, it's not my place to say that. But having worked for many, many men over the course of my career as well, I can tell you that I haven't experienced the same manifestation of these qualities in those male leaders. And you can make of that whatever you choose to. I can actually feel the fire in my belly to rise, to reset, to reimagine, and to recreate. Uh, and I really hope that you are sharing this feeling with me today as well. So it's the 21st annual Women in Business Conference. And the fact that this committee has been in existence for the past 21 years at the GSB, I think speaks to the fact that the GSB is really committed to elevating and putting the spotlight on the role of women in leadership. So on behalf of the GSB, I would like to extend our gratitude to our incredible speakers. Thank you for sharing your time, your learnings, your wisdom, and your passion for driving the agenda of elevating women to thrive as we contribute to the spaces that we occupy. I'd also like to, to share our gratitude for our sponsors. And, um, and you know, this event really, we, we lean heavily on sponsors. And, and the fact that this conference could be accessible to so many women at a, like a small price point really uh, talks to the kind of sponsors and backing we have from from these wonderful sponsors. So our platinum sponsor, I wanna say thank you to RCL. Thank you so much for coming on board. Um, our gold sponsors, Bain & Co, Pick & Pay, Solution Space, See Her Thrive. Thank you to you for contributing to this conference. And our silver sponsor, Vitrus Consulting. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, and to the Women in Business Committee, I love that you have placed the spotlight on the leadership legacy of this conference. You know, being the chair of this com committee in 2011, um, you know, really set the tone for me and to have a platform to really drive the agenda of raising the game of women leaders. And um, every year since then, I have enjoyed celebrating and supporting all the chairs and committees that have come after my time. Um, I have seen the confer conference gain more interest over the years and the themes become bolder. So I salute all of you. And you know, I remember our first call together and when we talked about face-to-face, -face, uh, a face-to-face -face conference and we were at the precipice of this pandemic. And I said to you, you know, you have to have a plan B. And what happens if we don't have, we aren't able to come together face to face. And so here we are rocking plan B. And you have done a phenomenal, phenomenal job to get this conference running in the way that you have. Um, so well done for being true am brand ambassador. Well done for being true brand ambassadors of excellence for the GSB. I now have the honor and privilege to introduce you to our dynamic incoming GSB director, Dr. Catherine Duggan. She will be the second woman in the history of the GSB to take up the significant leadership role. As you can imagine, the GSB community are so excited about having her take up her seat at the head of our table. So it's very fortuitous 
that Dr. Duggan can join us from New York this afternoon. And how appropriate that this GSP Women in Business Conference is her very first gig as our incoming director. So Catherine, welcome, and I hand over to you. Thank you so much, Kameshni, and thank you for the invitation. One of the things that I've learned as I've been learning more and more about the GSB over the past few weeks is just what an extraordinary community it is, and particularly what an extraordinary community of women we have at the GSB. I'm really looking forward to being more of a part of this group of women and to see and experience the tremendous effect and the tremendous impact that this organization and its members and all of our female GSB alums are having in South Africa and on the continent more generally, and in fact, in the world. So as I was asked to give a few words and to really introduce myself, I was trying to decide which quote to use. And I decided to start with one of my favorite ever quotes. It is written by a, a Nigerian author whom I hope all of you know. Her name is Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. And she said something that I think is so in line with both the theme of this conference and with some of the things that we've heard all day. She says, stories matter. Many stories matter. Stories have been used to dispossess and to malign, but stories can also be used to empower and to humanize. Stories can break the dignity of a people but stories can also repair that broken dignity. And I wanted to start with that because I think that it's so important for us, not only as women, but as business leaders, including the men on the call, whom I'm very pleased to see, all of us have stories. And I think the power of an event like this is partly so that we can hear one another's stories and learn from one another's stories. And it's such an important thing to do in part because it allows us to hear the, each other's vulnerabilities and to understand that the things that we see are not exclusive to us. Many people are seeing similar things, both in terms of challenges, but also in terms of opportunities. And as we can bring together people who are really having these similar, although obviously unique experiences, the more we can learn from one another, the more we can support one another, and the more we can really build organizations and build institutions like the GSB into what we so strongly know they can become. So let me just give you a couple of thoughts as I think about what I'd really like to say to you in these few minutes. So, so the first is, as we think about these stories and as we think about how to be vulnerable, I think it's incredibly important for us not only to ask for vulnerability from other people, but exactly as Kameshni and some of the speakers today have said, to understand how to tap into our own vulnerability, both for self-reflection, but also so that we can share our experiences. And again, not just with other women, but with people throughout the organization and people throughout our society. And the idea, and I love this, the idea that vulnerability creates courage is absolutely right. I could not have said that better. And I think that if there's one thing for me to take away from this, it's that. And I'll share a couple of stories from my own background, in part, so that I can illustrate that. So the first thing that I'll say is I've spent 20 years, actually more than 20 years now, working on the African continent in a large number of different countries. A lot of what that's entailed is doing things that were well out of my comfort zone, and in some cases, doing things that lots of people thought that I shouldn't do. I've traveled by myself all over the continent. In some cases, there was no way to get from point A to point B other than hitchhiking, and I have never felt that there was a problem. I'm always careful, but I've never felt that there was a problem. And that ability to eventually grow into the courage that was necessary is a metaphor that I've taken on throughout my personal life, and in fact, throughout my professional life. 
thinking that there are things that frighten me, that there are things that other people are telling me that I shouldn't do, but that with adequate planning, with care, I can embrace and I can do. And once I've done them, I can think to myself, boy, there's a world of things that I have never thought to do and that I'm going to go out and be courageous and do. So that's one of the things that I wanted to share with you. And one of the other things is I wanted to tell you that so much of being courageous is about having people in your life, your professional life and your personal life who will support that bravery. In my case, from an early age, that person was my father. My father also lived in Africa, especially as a young man. And when I called him up and told him about 20 years ago that I was going to go by myself to Lagos, to Nigeria, for the first time, my father didn't say, be careful. My father didn't say, oh dear, I'm not sure you should do that. My father said, oh, that's excellent. Lagos was very interesting in 1963, and I can only imagine that it's become even more interesting since. I look forward to seeing what it is that you see there. That kind of support is something which is so invaluable as we build our courage. And again, not only as we build our courage in the world, but as we build our courage even inside our offices, or in this case, inside our houses and inside our families. As we become the people whom we most wish ourselves to be, knowing that we have the support of people who see things in us that perhaps we don't even see in ourselves, and knowing that we can provide that support, seeing things in other people and in other women that perhaps they don't yet see in themselves, knowing that we can play that role is such a critical part of bringing other women along, but also of learning ourselves. Because the more we mentor, the stronger, more capable, more vulnerable, but more courageous we feel. So let me just say, I think we've heard about this already, and I want to double underscore the fact that diversity, the courageousness, that an understanding of the fact that we are all different and we all bring different things, that diversity creates profit and it creates success in business. And it, the way that it creates success is as people who have different viewpoints sit at a table and really make their viewpoints known. Part of the courage, especially as women and especially as minorities, especially as women of color, especially as people in some cases who have expertise that is in the minority, in the boardroom table, in the conference room table, or in the classroom. Whatever our personal experience of courage and of vulnerability has been, it creates a unique worldview for us, and that unique worldview allows us to drive forward the way that people think. It makes groups smarter, and it makes organizations better, more profitable, more effective, and it allows them to have a bigger impact than they ever would have had before. And so I encourage you, there's always a risk, there's always a temptation to pull back, to hide your courageousness, to think to yourself, maybe this is not the part of myself that I should show. And if you don't show your courageousness, you also don't show your vulnerability, and you're not showing who you are and what it is that you know. And so I want to encourage you, again, that outspokenness, that courage, that interest and willingness to speak from a position of knowledge about the world and about experience that no one else has. That is actually absolutely critical to the good functioning of organizations. And so I absolutely encourage you to do that. And as you take this challenge on, I also encourage you to be not something which is what a lot of us are, which is perfectionist about ourselves and about other people. So if I compare that, the courage, the vulnerability, and the real interest in stepping up and making your voice heard, I know that that often comes with a feeling that you cannot make a misstep, 
a feeling that you have to be everything to everybody. And this tremendous pressure that everybody feels, but that women feel often particularly hard on themselves about. This need to be perfect, this need to feel perfect in our own eyes. And I think that that is something that every single one of us can work on. And it's so important because again, we not only need to learn to be ourselves, which is different from some sort of perfect idea, we need to embrace our own power and our own perfection as individuals and unique individuals, rather than trying to be something that we're not and something that would be less powerful than what we are today. And so in order to give you another story from myself, from my own history about imperfection or what seems like it could be imperfection, but which is actually an extraordinary kind of perfection. This is a story that I wanted to share, especially as all of us are working at home. Some of you I know are working at home with children and with so many things going on, feeling pulled in all sorts of directions. And I wanted to really reassure you that everything is okay, even when we feel as though we're imperfect across all sorts of areas. And the story that I wanted to share with you as I wrap up is a story actually not about me as much as it is about my mother. My mother was a doctor in Chicago. She, was, she specialized in taking care of premature babies. And what that meant was that not only was she literally saving the lives of babies, but it meant that she was doing that at all hours of the day and night, sometimes on Christmas, during all kinds of holidays. There were lots and lots of birthdays where my mother either couldn't be there or she had to leave in the middle because literally she had to save somebody else's child. And what I want to emphasize about that to you is that decades and decades and decades on, none of the missed birthdays, none of the missed Christmases, none of the missed school plays are the thing that I remember. And unfortunately, my mother passed away decades ago. And so I can tell you, as a person who is thinking about a woman, the woman that I would like to be, the woman whom I have become, I think often to that experience as a child with my mother, because the thing that I remember about the gift that she gave me was the gift of knowing that things do not have to be perfect, that she literally could not do everything. And then the gift I wish I could give her is the knowledge that I understand, I appreciate that. And in fact, honestly, I think that I am better off. I think I'm a stronger woman. I think that I'm a stronger leader and certainly a more empathetic leader because I recognize that it doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to be at everything. You do not have to be everything to everyone. You choose your battles, you show courage, you show vulnerability, and you show empathy. And then after that, it's about who you are, what you bring, and the team that you can build around you. And so that's what I wanted to share with you, particularly at this moment when we're all trying to do everything from home and there are only so many hours in the day and so many children running around and so many job requirements. So with that, I want to say I'm so looking forward not only to taking the helm of the GSB and really highlighting the tremendous things that the GSB and the community of faculty, staff, students, and alumni at the GSB are doing in this space and in so many other spaces, but to say really to give you a formal invitation as students, as alumni, and as friends of the GSB to give you a formal invitation to work with us so that we can empower women, so that we can empower people, and so that we can really build the future and be part of building the future that all of us know South Africa and the children of South Africa and Africa and the children of Africa, and in fact, the children of the world and the companies and the women of the world the future that they deserve and that we would like to see for ourselves, 
for the women who come after us and for the children whom we know and whom we love.